All right, guys, Murph's here. And today I want to talk about the squad designated marksman concept. Now this is actually going to be kind of a two part series because originally I was going to string everything together, the concept, and then also like really good features or things that you should look at whenever you're trying to build a designated marksman's rifle. But I decided that the combination was too long. There was a lot of different information shifting gears and the, the video was going to be really long. So instead I thought I'd break it into two parts. One, where we talk about kind of the historical concept and its evolution, and then a second that I'll do later about features that might be what you're after out of a designated marksman's rifle. But first, we gotta go ahead and identify some terms, talk about the history, and then successful and unsuccessful implementations of the squad designated marksman concept. Now, what we first need to identify is the difference between a sniper and a designated marksman. This is a pretty big difference, and it's not necessarily properly represented throughout history. Now, a sniper is either a single man or somebody working in a two-man team in a spotter-shooter type relationship who is responsible for engagements ranging beyond 600 yards with a rifle. Uh, so with that, we've had sniper engagements now go all the way out to 3,540 meters. So that's a, that's a pretty big span to be able to reach with a rifle. And the targets that are being engaged at this distances are, are these distances, I should say, are either high value targets, targets of opportunity, or perhaps some sort of anti-materiel type situation, which would require a larger caliber firearm. Now the weapons that snipers use are specifically designated precision rifles that they utilize to be able to accomplish their tasks, ranging from as small as 308 all the way up to 20 millimeter guns. Right now, the sniper is more commonly using weapons like 300 Win Mag or 338 Lapua in order to be able to accomplish their tasks. However, they can, of course, use a lighter overall weapon system if the situation calls for it, just like they can take shorter shots if the situation calls for it. They don't have to shoot at 600. They can shoot below that and quite well. They are trained exhaustively in long range marksmanship, as well as the field craft utilized to be able to conceal themselves to not only take their shots on high value targets, but also perform reconnaissance type missions. So concealment as well as the movement techniques involved in that. They are generally detailed out in the military sense. We're primarily talking about military snipers at the moment. They're detailed out at the battalion level as an asset and can frequently adjust on the fly whatever it is that they need to do to be able to accomplish the mission. I think that pretty much covers snipers. Let's talk about squad designated marksmen. Well, squad designated marksman is some infantryman who has distinguished himself as being an excellent marksman and therefore gets to either put a magnified optic on his rifle, gets issued a streamlined, accurized version of his own service rifle, or gets a purpose-built rifle designated for him for the purpose of being a squad designated marksman. He is supposed to fill in the gap from 300 to 600. Now, especially with intermediate cartridge service rifles and all that kind of stuff, you can definitely engage further than 300 yards. However, based on military doctrine, we expect that the average rifleman is only going to engage out of 300 yards and after that you need something else. So, the squad designated marksman not just brings in the capability to be able to engage from three to 600, but he also brings in the ability to be able to identify targets and be able to, to direct fires against those threats, be it giving distance direct, uh, description and direction to the machine gunners or assisting in call for fire type measures. At the end of the day, he's still an infantryman. He's still required to be able to do basic infantry tasks. Yeah, I think that pretty much covers squad designated marksmen there. Now, we didn't really talk about LE snipers, so let's just go ahead and plug that in just for fun. So law enforcement snipers generally are going to be making much closer shots. For the majority of actual shots taken by law enforcement snipers, they've been under 100 yards. However, there's still the possibility that they might have to take a longer shot, say, at a public event of some sort that they might be working as coverage for. So it's not outside the realm of possibility. It just hasn't shown up yet in any situations. A lot of times when they're called out, they are responding to barricaded suspects or hostage type situations. And I would say that the law enforcement sniper has a much more interesting dynamic when it comes to accuracy. The shots that they're taking might be very narrow opportunities 
in which the order is given for them to be able to engage that shot. They might, if there's anybody who's going to have the possibility of having to take that Hollywood, take out the hostage taker right next to the hostage's face, it would be the LE sniper, though I would imagine getting authorization for that shot would be incredibly difficult because that is, that's a narrow window that you're trying to hit right there. Not saying it's outside of the realm of possibility, just saying that it's kind of difficult overall. And the possible circumstances or you know, if you miss that shot, you take out that hostage, that's not a good day. You're kind of in trouble at that point. Now, the LE sniper also has to take into account over-penetration, not just for harm to hostages, but also over you know, blowing around through the entire house and killing the neighbors might be a problem, depending on the situation. Now, keep in mind, snipers can flex down into a designated marksman's role, but a designated marksman does not necessarily have the same amount of training to be able to flex up into a sniper's role. There's a good possibility that a designated marksman doesn't have any training beyond he has a firm grasp of the fundamentals, which makes him a good marksman. So something to consider there as well. Now, history-wise, let's go ahead and dip into the history. Really, truly, as long as there have been projectile weapons, there have been people skilled in their use and identified and specifically utilized for those skills. I would say that the first example of squad designated marksmanship, and this is where things get difficult in history because these terms don't exist until actually fairly recently, the difference between snipers and squad designated marksmen. So we kind of have to utilize the definitions that we've used so far to be able to process this information and kind of identify where this comes from. Now the first use, what I would say would be the first use of designated marksmen would actually be from American colonists fighting in the French and Indian War. Ha! Bet you that surprise. You probably thought I was going to say the American Revolution. No, actually, those same type of weapon systems and tactics that were used in the American Revolution actually found their origin in the, amongst the colonists fighting in the French and Indian War. Now, this time, these guys managed to, by German immigrants, get a hold of something known as rifling in their weapon systems. Now, rifling was originally developed as a place for the byproducts of black powder to be able to collect in the barrel. There's a lot of particulate matter that gets left behind and can potentially cause bore obstructions if enough rounds are fired. So the idea was that if we have lands and grooves in the barrel, perhaps it would collect there and give longer amount of time in between cleaning for shooting. What was also found was that it actually caused the weapon system to be more accurate. Now, more accurate at this time is kind of something we got to we got to go ahead and talk about here. When we're talking about smoothbore muskets, accuracy is being able to hit a man-sized target at 100 yards. And that's kind of optimistic. With this rifling in the weapon system, now you're able to engage a man-sized target up to 200 yards. That's a pretty drastic increase. You could definitely see where this might be advantageous. Now the question is, why did this not get more widely adopted in the military sense? And it comes down to two things. Tactics and cost. At this time, you're still having mass numbers of troops arranging themselves out in the fields in front of each other and exchanging salvos. That type of precision accuracy isn't that helpful. You're still using volley fire regardless at this time. And we see that even with the eventual adoption of rifle, like rifled weapon systems for, the, for whole militaries, this tactic wouldn't go away and the American Civil War suffered for it. Big time, but we're not there yet. Let's go ahead and stick with what we are talking about now. Now, colonists during the American Revolution would use this piece of technology in order to be able to engage British officers because as it would turn out, that's not the norm in warfare at this time, but nobody wins a war by playing by rules. So in this case, the, the, the American colonists got to use their higher grade of precision to be able to disrupt enemy formations. Now. This soldier, or this American soldier armed with this rifled system, the um, Philadelphia or Kentucky long rifle, depending on who it is that you talk to, they still fought in battles. They still conducted general infantry tasks, which leaves me to call them a designated marksman during this time. However, with them only engaging high value, well, having a preference towards engaging high value targets, you could see where maybe it's more accurate to call them snipers. I, uh, I'll, I'll leave this one up to you guys. There's a lot of the early part of this history presentation that is open to interpretation. So 
And now something else to keep in mind about these weapon systems at the time is that the rounds, the bullets that were loaded in them were actually kind of oversized so that they would reliably grip the rifling, which would mean that it would take longer to reload, which is another disadvantage in a situation where you're, you're trying to get rounds downrange. Like, I would definitely like to be able to reload my weapon system quickly, especially if we're exchanging salvos. Now, moving forward, the British would actually adopt a rifled system for use during the Napoleonic Wars, and they would actually have an entire company of these riflemen, and they would strategically place them around the battlefield in order to be able to affect the best use out of their precision fires. And this is actually a concept that you continue to see into the American Civil War, where now the Confederacy would form squads and kind of move them around the battlefield, but the Union would form companies, if not all the way up to battalions, and would actually use these troops as skirmishers. So they would put them out in front of the lines of advancing troops to be able to make first contact with approaching Confederate forces, so that there would be enough time for everyone else to be able to get their stuff together to be able to get ready for battle and then pull those skirmishers back. Now, Confederate troops would use British Whitworth rifles or Enfield rifles and advanced, for the time, adjustable iron sights. Union forces would use Berdan Sharps rifles as well as a couple of other privately acquired commercial hunting rifles as well. Now, what would also be very interesting is that some of these sharpshooters, because sharpshooters is a frequently used term during this time period, would also get a hold of 1860 Henry lever action rifles, which I find very surprising because that's not exactly what you think of whenever you think of designated marksmen. But if you're performing as a skirmisher, it would be kind of nice to have 16 rounds on hand while you're trying to put up a quick uh, stepping stone for advancing enemy forces. Like I could, I could see where that's advantageous, especially if there's not that many. Like there's not a lot of skirmishers in a skirmish line, so you're still expected to put up a little bit of fight before it's time to go. I would want to give myself every advantage as well. Now, we would see some use of designated marksmen during the Spanish-American War. However, it would not be terribly common, and it would show the first time that telescopic sights were really, I don't want to say it getting heavily used, but it's another uptick in the use of telescopic sights. The Confederate, the, excuse me, the Civil War would, American Civil War, mind you, would also see some use of telescopic sights, but this is, this is very early. They are very, very simple matters. Uh, not a lot of magnification. We're talking under two power. Now, in World War I, we would see the first time the term sniper is used. And this would be just somebody's service rifle outfitted with a magnified optic. And we're not talking about terribly powerful magnified optics. And the idea was that these guys would be able to take targets of opportunity or perhaps assist in the elimination of machine gun teams during an advancement across no man's land. But here's where an important aspect of designated marksman concept comes in, and this is that this guy needed to be able to utilize his weapon system properly for his purpose. So in this case, he would mount a centrally mounted telescopic sight in order to be able to get the best use out of that sight in, in you know, correlation with where the bore is and all that kind of stuff. But that would mean that he would not be able to use stripper clips. So he would not have a faster, he would not have a fast reload system. So in battle, Sending this guy across no man's land to assault a trench is probably not the best use of him. Now, having him cover the advance of troops running up to seize a trench and then help assisting and holding that trench for the inevitable counterattack, that would be a good use of that, of that sniper in this case. But trying to use him like a regular infantryman is not that helpful to anybody involved. Now, in World War II, we would see kind of an expansion of the sniper concept overall, and maybe a little bit more time spent on selecting sniper rifles, but for the most part, we're still talking about an infantry weapon. It might just be a more accurate infantry weapon, hand-selected off of the production line because it showed a little bit more accuracy than the average. Now, things like the Springfield 1903A4 would not have iron sights attached to them. They would forego those in the overall production process once the rifle was identified as being 
unusually accurate or above normal in accuracy. And then we have the scope mounts attached and a two to four power with the option by the end of the war of an eight power scope. Other militaries wouldn't necessarily be so discerning. Also, if you look at the M1C Garand, those were identified early as being accurate rifles and then outfitted for optics. However, the M1D Garand, which is far more common, would just be an optics kit that could be attached to any M1 Garand. So that would be incumbent upon the user to discern whether or not the rifle it was being attached to showed above average accuracy. Now that's kind of how the sniper thing goes right there. And you've got guys like Simo Hea, who's out there just stacking Russian bodies and really kind of showing the field craft aspect of sniping, like kind of the earliest echoes of it. World War One kind of had the same kind of overall thing, but if you're looking for someone to pick out the need for a sniper to be specially trained in concealment, it's Simo Haya. Haya? I'm probably messing it up. Oh, well, I'm sorry. So, you would also see a very interesting step in the correct direction on designated the marksman, and this would be actually out of the Germans with the ZF-41 1.5-power one long eye relief scope. This was a scope that would be mounted off of the rear sights of the Mauser K-98K and would go to the best marksman in a squad. And then this guy would be able to utilize his shooting fundamentals in order to be able to get the most out of one of one and a 1.5-power scope. Now, 1.5-power is not a lot of magnification, but if you're already doing pretty good with iron sights, 1.5-power can only help at that point. And it was actually the Germans' intention to get everybody outfitted with a ZF-41 scope. However, they never got production up to where it needed to be and it would never come to pass. Now, in the 1950s, we would see actual sniper programs start to be developed. And by the 1960s, we would have designated sniping rifles developed, not just repurposed or hand-selected service rifles. Now, if you look at the Soviet doctrine in the 1960s and 1970s, we see the Dragunov and PSL rifles come out in order to be used as not just designated marksman's rifles, but also sniper's rifles. And the Soviets are kind of as ambiguous in the use of designated marksman versus snipers as about everyone else was up until probably about the 1980s. Now, in the 1990s, the Marine Corps would take a serious look at its own doctrine on urban warfare after seeing a lot of the stuff that happened in like Lebanon and Beirut in the 80s. And they would decide through a lot of training and kind of personal assessment that they needed to develop a squad designated marksman capability, that there was a gap that wasn't properly being exploited by the average infantryman, and that was the three to 600 yard gap. Now, a lot of people might be surprised that it was urban warfare operations that got this rethought instead of, you know, maybe more conventional conflict. However, and that's because Urban warfare is a lot of times considered to be house-to-house -house fighting, a lot of room-clearing type operations, which most, most definitely happen. But that's not to say that there are not the possibility of long-range shots incorporated in that combat. You still have tall buildings, which give you a lot of line of sight around an area, potentially have tall buildings that give you a lot of line of sight. And you also might want to identify other tall buildings to see whether or not the enemy's hanging out in there. So there's still a role for somebody to be able to have a long-range capability in urban warfare. So in order to address this, at first the Marine Corps would designate an ACOG with an M16A2 to be a designated marksman's rifle. But they would very quickly go to an accurized M16A2 known as the SAM-R. Now in parallel development at about the same time, the SOCOM, I guess SOCOM in general was taking a look at this, both uh, the Green Berets as well as the Navy SEALs. And they would actually kind of contribute to the same parallel development that would make up the Mark 12 series of rifles. And this would be a special purpose receiver, or SPR, that was built from the ground up to be an accurized M16A2, effectively. It would sport an 18-inch barrel in most configurations, but it was still a 5.56 caliber rifle, and it was running off of really whatever scope could be sourced at the time. This was an incredibly successful design, and actually the Marine Corps would also take notice of it and employ it as well. Now, in the late 90s, early 2000s, there would be a Russian invasion of Chechnya. And the fighting that would occur there would also really kind of give a boost to this overall concept of the squad designated marksman. What the Chechens would do is that they would take a four-man team made up of a PKM, a Dragunov or PSL, an RPG, and a guy with an AK and everyone else's ammo. 
and they would maneuver these teams around the battlefield and use them to effectively pin down Russian forces as well as take out armor. It was a pretty well-rounded little team that they had going there at the time. Now, fighting in Afghanistan would also wind up eventually taking its own look at the squad designated marksman's concept. Something that's important to keep in mind is that the south of Afghanistan is incredibly open. In places like Helmand and Kandahar provinces, you're actually talking about very wide deserts instead of the mountains that you see in a lot of the rest of the country, honestly, in the other provinces. And it was very quickly identified that the enemy would start engaging from greater distances. Now, at this time, in like the we'll call it the early 20 teens, it's frequently reported that the average combat distance is 186 yards. And this is where data is kind of deceptive because that's literally taking entire countries worth of data, putting it all together and taking an average like that. That does not mean that that is going to be this is true, it's gonna hold true for every province that you're fighting in, for every section of a country that you're fighting in. In Kanahar, Nangahar, and Helmand provinces, it was far more common to see over 400 meter engagements. Some guy would grab a PKM, he'd hose down whatever maneuvering element for a little bit, and then he'd drop it and disappear into the fold. It was quickly identified that not only did they need, did people need a capability to be able to identify targets at a greater distance, but also be able to engage them with some energy. The army initially would go with M16A4s with ACOGs, however, that was very quickly shelved for not having enough power. What would ultimately happen is first, M14s would be dropped into Sage, inter, uh, Sage EBR chassis and outfitted with Leopold Mark IV scopes. Then M110 SASs would be brought online with the same scopes and used to great effect in the south of Afghanistan. Because now you're talking about 7.62 by 51 millimeter cartridge power being used. You got something that's delivering a lot more energy out at 600 yards than your average 5.56, even in the Mark 262 77 grain OTM round. Now, in the current trend of things, it seems that the squad designated marksman is here to stay. The military has made a couple of different changes. The Marine Corps move over to the M27 IAR has caused them to also press that into the squad designated marksman's role. And the Army has recently adopted a variant of the HK-417 for use as their squad designated marksman. The British adopted the L-129A1, which is produced by LMT. And it's actually interesting that the Marine Corps, the M-27 IAR, because the British were previously using the L-86 machine gun in the same overall kind of role. And that's kind of what the Marine Corps is doing. I find that, that comparison, that parallel to be very interesting. Well guys, I think that pretty much brings us up to date on kind of how the flow of the concept for squad designated marksmanship has kind of progressed over the ages. So I hope you guys found this interesting and it'll be a lot of fun when we go over part two because I'm actually working on a squad designated, another squad designated marksman's rifle right now. And I'm kind of using this build to kind of drive some of my opinions and thoughts, kind of test some things that I hold personally to be true and see how well they actually hold up. So. Stay tuned, at some point I'll drop that video as well. But until then, that's pretty much what I got. Have a good day.